um, go ahead and get started today. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for joining this month's Grundfest lecture. Um, just a few logistical notes as always. Um, the talk will end at um, 1 p.m. today and the future talks will be on this website um, if you want to follow along. Um, and also some of the previous talks are now on YouTube. I know a lot of people have been asking about that. Um, and just a final note, um, next month's talk will be the last for um, a few months because we'll be taking the summer months off and we'll start up again um, in September. This lecture series is hosted in remembrance of Professor Warren S. Grenfest, who is a professor of bioengineering, electrical engineering, and surgery at UCLA. Uh, professor Grenfest was an SPIE fellow in biophotonics and a strong advocate of junior scholars, which has inspired this lecture series focus on early career researchers in computational imaging and related fields. I want to thank the co-organizers of this lecture series, Professor Achuta Kadambi at UCLA, Professor Kitty Bauman at Caltech, and myself and Prajim Nachari, who are PhD students at UCLA. Um, lastly, I want to thank the sponsor of this lecture series, Akasha Imaging, which is a computational imaging startup on polarization. Um, and Akasha sponsors an inverse honorarium, um, like I mentioned earlier, so we can highlight um, speakers in non permanent positions like. Uh, PhD students and postdocs. So with that out of the way, I'm very excited to introduce this month's speaker, um, Yana Starth, who is a, a third year PhD candidate um, in the CS department at UT Austin. Um, and Giannis, um, his research is supported by a few fellowships, including the Badosky, Anasis, and Leventis fellowships. Um, and Giannis performs research on generative modeling, and he is interested in improving, improving many aspects of generative models from understanding the fundamental theoretical limits of learning distributions to developing practical algorithms to solve inverse problems with deep generative priors. Um, so today, Giannis will tell us um, some more about his work. He'll give a talk titled Generative Models and computational imaging, soft diffusion, and learning from corrupted data. Um, so I want to thank Giannis for being here today, and I will pass it off to him to tell us some more about this. Awesome. Thanks so much for the introduction, for having me here. So let me one sec share my screen. Uh, okay. Um, do you see my screen? Okay, cool, let's start. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so today um, I'm gonna talk about uh, this journey that started like three years ago in my PhD. Uh, and the journey is about how we can use generative models uh, to solve inverse problems. And so we're gonna talk about a couple of works um, that are in the intersection of generative modeling and computational imaging. So with that, let's get started. So let's do a little bit of like history of generative models. So generative models have been around uh, for a while, uh, but people like didn't really pay a lot of attention. And I guess mainly the reason was that like back then generative models like were generating images like this. Um, so the images were not like actually really promising. Um, and like most of the research was mostly on like uh, discriminative models. Uh, but then today's generative models are actually really, really amazing. Um, so we went from this to this. Uh, so this, uh, this person does not exist, uh, is in the imagination of a neural network called Stalgan, and it actually looks like really, really photorealistic, and there are actually websites online, there's a website called this person does not exist, and you can go and every time you refresh, you get a new person that looks like completely realistic, or maybe like, I don't know, if your eye has been like brain, you can spot the details, but for the most part, it looks like super realistic, uh, but this person does not exist. And there is nothing special about like human faces. Uh, so we can do this with any sort of data pretty much. As long as we have like a lot of data, we can train like generative models on this domain. So for example, this aerial photo does not exist. Uh, so there has been like another version of style you can train on aerial photos and now it can generate like aerial photos that do not exist. And also like this chemical bond does not exist. It's generated by a conditional generative model. 
that takes us into like some amino acid sequence and spits out this 3D structure uh, that looks like a real chemical ball, but it might not be. Um, so uh, nowadays, like the generative models have actually um, have a new superpower and this uh, superpower is that like they can be like text condition. Uh, so now we can like just type prompts like an astronaut riding a horse and we can put this to a generative model like DALI2 from OpenAI, Imagine from Google uh, or Stable Diffusion from Stability and we get like this image that's like an astronaut riding a horse. Uh, it's something that was not in the training set obviously, uh, but still like the, the network has picked up like uh, all the information needed to be able to generate these images. And we can even generate like art. We can say, oh, I want a painting of a fox in the style of Monet and we can get like an image like this. Uh, so they're, they are really impressive. I think there's no doubt about that. But the real question is, what can we do with uh, these generative models? So let's discuss some ideas. So the first idea would be to generate fake photos for social media. And some would argue that this is actually a very bad idea. And we should be able to do like more useful things with them. So another direction would be to create art. And there are actually a couple of people that are there like, uh, their job title is uh, artists using generative models now. Uh, and they produce like really amazing like pieces that someone would argue that are like as offending as as good as like con conventional art. But what we are actually super interested about in this talk is like, can we use these boxes to solve like real imaging problems? So someone spent like millions of dollars to like train a super like useful and super like powerful generator, but what can we do with it? And can we use it to solve like real problems? Uh, so that's gonna be like the theme of the talk. And let me give you like a brief outline. Um, so first of all, we're gonna talk some early work that we did uh, using guns, pre-trained guns to solve inverse problems. And then we're gonna explain why uh, gradually we had to switch from GANs and we had to use a new like class of uh, generative models that's called diffusion models. And then once we did this and we saw like this was actually working really well in like practical domains like MRI, we're like, okay, maybe we can like get some ideas from the inverse problem world and create like better like uh, generative models, better diffusion models using like some um, restoration intuition that we're gonna develop uh, later in this talk. And at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this talk, we're going to talk about like some recent ongoing work that we are doing in which we're trying to uh, train generative models like in the absence of real data. So we, on we only have like destroyed quality data and we are still able to like train generative models. So this is going to be like the theme. Um, it is basically generative models for and from inverse problems. And we're going to see like a fun genre of how this like uh, evolved during uh, my PhD. So let's start with the first part. Um, we're gonna go and talk about GANs. Uh, and we're actually gonna talk about this idea that we had called intermediate layer optimization that nowadays we think of it as a form of parameter efficient fine tuning. So let's see how like a generative model, uh, a, a conventional like GAN, uh, how would we think of it? So we think of it as like a box, this generator G, that takes us input like a low dimensional latent vector Z and spits out something that's like high dimensional, maybe an image, but it's a G of Z. Um, so, okay, so that's, that's great. So what we can do is we can like generate a bunch of like Z sample from some like uh, easy distribution, maybe the normal distribution. And then for each one of them, we get a real image. We get an image that looks like real actually, and it's not. But what we care about doing right now is solving the easiest of the inverse problems, which is, this is a photo of my advisor, Alex Timagis. And we are trying to find, is there any Z in the latent space of the generative model that gives something that is in the imagination of this box and is as close as possible to uh, my advisor. Uh, so the real optimization problem that we are gonna try to solve is that we are gonna optimize over all the potential Gs and find the one that minimizes the error between G of Z and our image X. And if you do this, what you get is you get this guy. And when I saw this to my advisor back in um, 2020, I guess, he was not really happy. He was like, okay, this guy kind of looks like me, but he's not really me. Um, he looks older and we have some like facial details that are not the same. And he was like, what can we do? And why, why is that a problem? Like why we cannot get my face? So there could be a lot of like potential like uh, explanations of why this is the case. For example, one of them would be that like we didn't solve this optimization problem really well because we, we just approximate the solution with gradient descent. But I think the main reason this happens is the model is not expressive enough. Imagine that like, the network is something that goes from a low dimensional space, like this Z that lives in, like, in K dimensions, let's say, and it spits out an image that is like very high dimensional. So there might be like some images that they cannot be like described by this like low dimensional vector. And this is the reason that we have this problem. So we had this idea that was accepted in ICML uh, 2021. 
that was basically, let's say, okay, someone trained this box. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go take this box and split it into two halves. So instead of thinking it of as like one generator that directly gets like a low dimensional vector and spit out an image, we're going to think of it as like the composition of two generators. The first generator spits out a bigger latent, and the second generator like spits out an image. So now what we want to do is we want to like increase the expressivity of this model. And instead of like just trying to find what like low dimensional vector like corresponds to the image of my advisor, what we're going to do is we're going to go to this intermediate space um, that is much more expressive because not all of these intermediate vectors can be expressed by G1 and look there. So the optimization problem that we're going to solve is going to give us this. And it's like actually really hard for me to tell which one is real and which one is not. Uh, there are some like, things that are off uh, the background maybe and like something in the glasses. But like, this is actually really powerful. Um, now, okay, so the inversion case was like really, really uh, trivial because we don't really care about this as a problem. It's a very trivial problem, but we can very easily extend this idea to any inverse problem. So what we observe is we observe an AX, some corrupted version of, of our like uh, image, maybe like some block is missing. And what we want to find is we want to find some like intermediate latent Z intermediate that if you feed it to the second part of the generator, it's going to be close um, to this like image, but in the things that we observe. So A times G2 of Z intermediate should be close to A of X. And we want to put like some regularization because if we do this um, and we don't put any regularization, we might get like zero error on the things that we observe, but we, may get, we might get like very crazy things in the things that we don't observe. So the regularization that we put is that like this vector that we find needs to be close to the imagination of the first network. So if you replace this first statement, instead of making it like close, you make it, it needs to be to the imagination of the first network, then you don't have expressivity. You go back to this like previous problem that we have. But if you make it close enough, you still use the prior of this pre-trained model because like, you know, this like intermediate uh, space has like some geometry, uh, but now you can increase the expressivity by deviating from this prior a little bit. And that's what we did. Uh, and the results are actually pretty good. Uh, so we can solve all sorts of inverse problems. We can just like uh, add like a lot of like uh, impending bubbles. And then we see on the second column, our reconstruction and then the reconstruction of the baseline. That's like, it looks like a, it looks like a, a real person maybe, but it's not like the thing that we wanted to reconstruct. It has like a lot of hallucinations. Um, and we can even do this with, by just like observing like 5% of the pixels. So this image on the very left is not actually a black image. 5% of the pixels are observed. Um, so the neural network is going to use this uh, and make a reconstruction that looks almost perfect. And this is actually like um, something that we're like really happy with. Uh, and then we had a follow-up paper that was accepted in ICML uh, 2022 uh, that we combined generative models like GANs with diffusion models. And we were able to do this even with 1% of the measurements. So we went as extreme as 1% of the measurements and we, we could still like get reasonable construction of our, of our image. But like, why do we care about diffusion models in the first place? Like, why do we think about them? Why do we try to do this? And the reason is actually that we were trying to solve a problem, a real problem, which is accelerating MRI. And this actually failed uh, for guns. So we tried a bunch of like, um, a bunch of months we were like uh, trying to train like good generators for MRIs and then trying to use them as priors to solve this problem. But this actually didn't really work. Uh, but what did work was actually diffusion models. Um, and we have like this paper, except at New York 2021. Uh, and in this paper, we saw that we can actually uh, accelerate MRI six times, and we still get like reconstruction that could be potentially uh, diagnostically useful. Um, so that was actually like um, the result that convinced us that we need to work with diffusion models. Um, and now every day, everyone is working with diffusion models. So that was the right call. And for us, this was the wake up call that we need to change our focus from guns to diffusion models. So what are actually diffusion models? So let's talk a little bit about them uh, because it's gonna be the topic of the rest of the talk. Um, so we know that like what we want in generative modeling is that we want to create like uh, data from noise and the opposite direction is actually really stupid and it's not useful like creating like uh, noise from data. It's just like you're corrupting your data. Why would you do that? Um, you want to go the opposite direction, but it turns out that there is a duality. And if you are careful in the way that you're corrupting your data, then there are like meaningful things that you can do. Um, and then like the central idea behind diffusion models is this duality between like corrupting and decorrupting, um, like corrupting your data and then reversing that process. 
So let's try to see how we'd come up with diffusion models from a very, very simple like uh, perspective. Uh, and basically what I'm gonna try to uh, convince you is that diffusion models are basically restoration models. So we know that if we had like an image that was like an image of a cat that had like a little bit of noise, uh, we could just train like a very good denoiser that would perfectly denoise these images, and we could do this very well with like modern technology. But then if our cats or like our face has like so much noise um, and we try to like just put this noise to the noise and try to denoise it in one step, what we are gonna get instead is we're gonna get a very blurry face. And why are we gonna get a very blurry face? We're gonna get a very blurry face because there are like a lot of potential like clean faces that could map to the same noise. So basically your neural network doesn't know which one of them was the true one and it's trying to minimize the error between all of the potential ones that could explain this noise so you have like a lot of noise, um, you get this blurry face, which is basically the average of all your data set in the extreme case that you just observe noise. Um, so that was like, that was a problem. And that, this is why like before we we're like training uh, generators um, uh, like with other techniques like adversarial training. Um, but the fusion models actually uh, are trying to attack this regression to the mean problem uh, by doing something clever. Uh, so they first observe how like, if you have this little bit of noise in your image, you could just use it in order to solve it. So instead of trying to solve like the problem in one shot, they're gonna say, okay, let's first, in the first step, let's try to solve like a problem that goes from a very, very, very noisy image to an image that has like a little bit of less noise, a little bit, like, it has a little bit of noise. And then we could just use a pre-trained denoiser out of the box to denoise this. And you could apply this idea recursively. And then you realize that all you need to do is that you need to have models that at each step, then you move just a little bit of noise. And if these models are trained perfectly and you chain them together, you have like a chain of potential denoisers, what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a generative model because you can start from pure noise and then you're gonna end up with clean images. So that's kind of like how this is gonna work. Uh, and this is why like diffusion models are restoration models. So what they do is they start from pure noise and they make a prediction for the clean image. And this prediction has a lot of mistakes. It's blurry like the phase that we saw before. And because it has a lot of mistakes, we need to repeat the process. So what we do is we add noise back but we just add a little bit of noise back. And then we repeat the process, we guess again. And then this guess is also wrong, but it's hopefully less wrong. So we noise it back to like remove these errors, the averaging effects. And then we, put, we repeat this process and we repeat and we repeat and we repeat. And that's kind of like how you should be thinking of diffusion models from a practical standpoint. And let me try to like formalize why is this the case? Like why mathematically this is correct? And the reason is actually connected to the world of differential equations. So we can think of it as like, we have a distribution and we corrupt it by just running a differential equation that maybe drifts our data and definitely adds a lot of noise. And for certain differential equations, for certain corruption procedures, this procedure is actually invertible and the reverse is also a differential equation. So what does that actually mean? It means that you can start from a noise, you can run this like second differential equation. And if you could run this, if you could simulate it in a PC, what you would get at the end of the day is you would get a clean image. And that's actually crazy. And it goes back to a result from 1982. Uh, and the result says that like, basically the inverse of a diffusion is also a diffusion, uh, which is really surprising. And all we need to do in order to generate images at the end of the day is that we need to be able to run this reverse process. But what do we need to run this? We have these functions f and g. These were our choices from the beginning. It's how we chose to corrupt our data. And we have this other thing that appears, which is called the score. Um, it's defined by Haivarinen in the paper estimation of non-normalized statistical models by score matching. Um, and we need this. So if we have if we have this 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 thing of like we need to train for this, we don't we don't know it. We we chose f and g, but we didn't choose this. So if we can actually estimate this gradient of the log likelihood, we can run the reverse process and like generate images. So let's look at an example. Uh, and this might be simplistic, but it's actually not. Uh, is what people actually do in practice. So for the choices of f and g, let's just put f to be like the zero function and z just like, just make it be a scalar that depends on the time. So like the higher the time, the more noise it adds. And what do we actually have if we discretize this process? Because you know, the continuous walls are like hard to understand. So let's look at the discrete versions of them. And if you discretize this process, you are gonna see that like basically at each point to get to the next iterate, what you do is you have your current iterate and you add a little bit of noise. And then if you repeat, you repeat, and you repeat, you arrive at a super like a super noise distribution at the limit. Uh, and the margins of this process, like if you have X0, it's actually pretty easy to describe what XT is gonna be. XT is gonna be X0 plus a certain amount of noise. And, and that amount of noise increases based on your time. 
So now what we care about estimating in order to generate samples with these like very simple like corruption procedure is we, we care about the score function, but that's very, very hard to estimate. To, to see why it's very hard to estimate, think of it, if the time is like zero, we're talking about the clean distribution, we actually need the density or maybe the gradient of the log likelihood of the, of the clean distributions, which might be extremely hard to describe. We might not have it in closed form, which is like really, really hard. And that's what we need in order to sample. But there is an object that's actually very tractable, which is the conditional score. So if we knew what was the original image X0, uh, we can definitely describe the density of XT given X0, which is just like a normal center in X0 and with appropriate, appropriate amount of noise. But like what we need to sample is we need the unconditional score, not the conditional score. So now the reason the diffusion models work is actually these two things are very much connected. So there's this result from Vincent 2011 that says that you can optimize for the conditional score and if you do it over all the pairs of X0 and XT, what you're going to learn is you're going to learn the unconditional score. And this was like a breakthrough result because in a sense, it enabled all the diffusion models because what we are trying to estimate is something that we don't have. This grand of the log likelihood, we cannot like go and like optimize for it directly. But going through this auxiliary objective, we can actually get it. And this is like really nice. And just let's go back to like the intuition that we had before that diffusion models are like denoisers or restoration models and try to understand why that's the case, um, it is actually true. Uh, and we get this result by uh, a very little, a very nice formula that's called like Tweedish formula. And what this is saying is that like the thing that you actually want, the score function, the gradient of the log likelihood is basically connected uh, through a very, very simple form to the best denoiser. And the best denoiser is a conditional expectation of X0 given XT. Your best guess for the clean image X0 given XT is your best denoiser. And that actually uh, can give you the score by a very simple like linear transformation. So this idea that we developed in the beginning that all we need is we need denoisers at different levels is actually correct. So this restoration intuition is correct. And the noiser is all you need, but you need them in different levels. So you need to have like the noises that work at different levels T. Um, and then as long as you have it, you can sample from any distribution you like. So that's really cool. Uh, and that's what gave us like these results for an MRI. And then we're like, okay, uh, let's try to think like how we can like generalize this idea. And the first thing that we, we said is like, why denoising? Like, could we do it in like different like corruption procedures? So like we view diffusion models as restoration boxes and the restoration that they were performing was denoising. But what about like we view them as the restoration box that do some, something else, maybe like they do the blaring. And the intuition was that, like, if we care about solving problems that are related maybe to the blaring uh, with these models that we're going to train, for example, we, we want to do like super resolution or you know, some problem that's kind of like more fundamentally connected to the blaring than like um, denoising, maybe training these models for the blaring is a better like idea. And when we actually like thought about this, we discovered that the original framework is not going to work. Um, so this like framework from Song et al uh, with the SDEs cannot actually capture this case because uh, for any linear choice of your function F that we had in the SDE, what you get is you get correlated noise, but there could be like other like uh, corruption procedures that are actually very easy. Um, so what you do is your XT is a linear transformation of X0 that depends on time plus some noise. And this noise is uncorrelated. And this is a case where the previous framework could not like describe. Um, so let's see some examples. Um, so we're going to try to do this uh, for, gen for like general CTs, general like corruption matrices. So one of them is basically just blaring your, blaring your image at different levels. And then you yeah. have you have a little bit of noise on top of it. Uh, someone is on uh, okay. uh, are you me? able to mute? Oh, okay. thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay, so let's get back to it. Uh, so what I was saying is that basically we can think of like uh, different like different corruptions. Uh, one of them is basically blaring your image and add a little bit of noise. Or an alternative idea would be you just like delete pixels of your image and then you add noise. So at the limit, what you have in these procedures, you have just like a black image with noise. And the surprising thing is that the theory work, and we we are able to do this in this paper. We are able to revert this process. So we we start with an image that has like it's completely black and it has a little bit of noise. And what we do is we run this process backwards. And at any, at any, at any point, what we do is like, we observe a little bit more and more and more pixels. So we grow our image from the center uh, to the edges. And at the end of the day, we have like a clean image. And the theory that we're gonna develop works like for any 
uh, for any linear corruption of this form and any, any linear corruption process. And the, and, the, and the question is like, how do you do this? So we, like we saw that the original framework was not working, um, like mathematically would not describe like corruptions that have like uh, uncorrelated noise, uh, but like linear transformations in your image. And we're like, okay, let's go back to this like very, very simple like restoration intuition that we had. And let's think of like how, the, what, what will this give us? So the restoration intuition was like, okay, we start with an image that's like black and it has like a little bit of noise. And we make a prediction about the clean image. And this prediction is really bad uh, because we just started from some black uh, color or something. So it might give us like, again, the average of the data set. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna corrupt back, but corrupt back a little bit less. So we add noise back to correct for these errors. And we also like just observe a single region like of this image that we predicted. And then we repeat, we repeat recursively of this idea. Um, and that would give us a model. And it turns out that like a concurrent work with ours uh, called, called Diffusion did exactly that. And it kind of worked. Uh, so what we are gonna try to explain here is why this intuition is almost correct and how would you generalize this? So this approach is almost correct. You can think of like any like uh, degradation that you want and you can try to do like uh, this like uh, recursive scheme and you, you're gonna try to uh, recursively uh, improve your prediction for the clean image. Um, but that's actually not exactly the correct thing to do. Um, and I'm gonna tell you what the exact thing is. So let's go back to this like little formula that we had before to this formula. So to this formula was connecting the score function with the best reconstructor given like this corrupted observation. And it turns out that this like to this formula can be generalized in the case where you have linear corruption. Um, and like you have this matrix CT that you didn't have before. And now the thing, that you the thing that we realized when we wrote down to this formula uh, for this specific case is that like uh, your score function is connected to your, the best reconstructor, but you don't actually need the best reconstructor. What you need is a projection um, of the best reconstructor with this matrix CT. So what you actually need is CT times the best reconstructor, um, which is something fundamentally different because for the, for the case for, of, for, of in painting, for example, so you don't need the clean image everywhere. So what you need is you need to match with the best reconstructor in the observed pixels. Um, so if you were like to actually train for this box, what you should have been training is not like just reconstructing your image from this corrupt observation, but you should be training for like a box that takes us input an image that maybe like some pixels are missing and has some noise. It predicts something, some, some clean image maybe, that if you blur it back or if you paint it back, it matches uh, with your observations. Uh, so we call this like uh, objective soft score matching, which is basically like what we had before, but it like multiplies the loss uh, with this CT matrix and brings it to the measurement space. So we have the, the loss in the measurement space and we're able to prove uh, that like we can use the minimizer of this loss function in a similar way as we were doing before, uh, to connect with a score function and be able to sample. Cool, so it turns out that this was actually a very good idea, a very good thing to, to do, uh, because by just, some, by just changing your corruption procedure and like moving from like um, adding noise to just like uh, corrupting with like blur uh, and then adding a little bit of noise on top of it um, and keeping all the other things the same. So we, we, kept, we kept like the model size the same, like the model architecture the same, all the training hyperparameters you can uh, get a lot of boosts. So you can get state-of-the-art um, results uh, for image generation measured by this metric called FID. And the other thing that you can get is that you can get like, uh, without doing anything, a speed up, uh, which is actually one of the biggest problems of these diffusion models. They need to run the reverse SDE. And this like can be very expensive. If you get a single sample, you might need like hundreds of thousands of iterations of the model. And we were able to show that by just changing the way you go up, Maybe you go to this like smoother corruption, which is blaring, and then you get a lot of speed up. Cool. So the, the message here is that the choice of corruption matters significantly for speed and performance. And with that, uh, I'm gonna move to the final like uh, part of the talk, which is gonna be uh, about learning from corrupted data. So what we did in like uh, soft diffusion was basically we, we, we decided how to corrupt our data in a better way. So we decided that instead of like adding noise, we might get, add a little bit of noise, but we also do like a linear corruption on top of it. 
But imagine a world where we don't have any clean data. So all, all, all we have is basically we have some um, linear measurements of our clean data, and we know which matrix corrupted uh, our data. We know this matrix A. So we have AX0 and this A. But this matrix is not invertible. Maybe what it does, it deletes pixels. So if you see an image that has like some pixels deleted, um, you cannot like reconstruct the original image uh, if a, a lot of pixels are missing. So this is like a non-invertible transformation. And the question is like, if we're in a situation where the data set is like this, if nature gave us images that had like these problems, they were corrupted in some sense, uh, can we still reconstruct the distribution? And there's one more question that's related to privacy. Uh, which is like, even if you can reconstruct the distribution, can you like say anything about like what an adversary that tries to get your like uh, training data uh, can do um, using your model? So let's see like some examples uh, just to make it very easy and intuitive. Um, so we are in a, we are in a scenario where like uh, we have like some faces and there is a black box like a gray box in this case that's like missing from all the faces. So all the images that we ever saw uh, had this box uh, and we knew the location of the box, uh, but we didn't know what it, it is in the box. And we want to train a model that like reconstructs the distribution without the box. Another case is that we only get to observe a box. So we have an image and we only get to see like some part of the image, maybe the eyes one time, the nose one time. And this is a random box. So we get to observe almost everything, but for any single sample, we only get to observe like a part of it, not everything. And you can even think of like the case that we're doing before, like with random in painting. So what we see is like, we just see a bunch of pixels, maybe 1% of the pixels on the image. And like all of our observations are like this and we're trying to learn the distribution. And the question is like, is this even possible? Like what we're trying to do, is this like something that it is possible to do? And I'm gonna tell you something that at least to me, it was really shocking when I first realized it. Uh, but maybe, you know, I'm not that clever, so maybe it's not as shocking to you, but for me, it was very, very shocking. Uh, and it is that, like, you can think of a case where your distribution is high dimensional, lives in D dimensions. And what you observe at its, at its time is, like, you observe samples that are, like, the inner product between, like, one of your samples and the Gaussian vector. So all the, thing, all the things that you observe, all the samples in your data set are, like, one dimensional. So the thing that you're trying to, to reconstruct lives in D dimensions. But what you get to see is you get to see like one dimensional projections, one dimensional Gaussian measurements. And due to something called like Kramer's wall theorem, it is actually possible given these one dimensional measurements to reconstruct perfectly the distribution, no matter how hard and no matter how complicated this distribution is. And as you can imagine, like if we don't have any structures about our data, if we don't know anything about the distribution of X, each uh, individual sample, it's very hard to reconstruct because you only get to see like a scalar that like comes from the sample. And there could be like many uh, different like uh, high dimensional things that could project to the scalar. And you don't know which one it is if you don't have any other prior. Uh, but the distribution you can reconstruct given infinite one dimensional uh, measurements. Um, so, the, so the thing that we're gonna talk about is how you do this. Um, so this is like ongoing work, but I'm gonna give you like a preview of the main idea. So what we're doing before is we are basically having this restoration like uh, idea that we had like some XT that was like uh, X0 plus noise and we're trying to reconstruct it. So we're training a box that given a noisy image, we're trying to reconstruct the clean image. But this thing actually is not, we cannot optimize for this anymore. And the reason we cannot optimize for this anymore is because we don't have X0 and therefore we cannot have XT. Um, what we get to observe is A of X0 and A of XT maybe, we can create it, uh, given the A that we observe and the X0 that we observe, but we don't get to uh, observe uh, X0. So we cannot optimize for this. And the naive idea to, is, would be to do the soft score matching. So the soft score matching would say, okay, uh, you're gonna give to your model, whatever you have. So you give to your model A of XT and A. So A of XT might be like an image that in some pixels are completely missing and some pixels have like a little bit of noise. And what you're trying to predict is you're trying to predict a clean image that matches uh, in, the observed, uh, in the observed pixels uh, what you have. But if you do this, like basically this is not gonna work. And the reason this is not gonna work is because uh, your model doesn't have any reason to do well in the non-observed region. Um, you only penalize the things that you observe. So like this can be arbitrarily bad in all the directions that belong to the null space of this matrix. And there is a null space because this matrix is like uh, not invertible. So to think of it in the in painting case in a very intuitive like sense, 
if like you're gonna be graded in an exam and you know like that there are gonna be like 10 questions and the professor only gonna like grade six of them, you're not gonna study for all the questions. You're just gonna study for the ones that you know that you're gonna be graded on. So you can cheat. And we don't want the model to be able to cheat because the predictions are gonna be like arbitrarily bad in the pixels that we don't observe. So we have this funny idea uh, that we can prove some things about. Uh, and this idea is like doing something like kind of absurd uh, in the first loop, at uh, the first loop, because what it does is that like we have our data, A of XT maybe, and what we do is we corrupt them a little bit more. And we fit the model a little bit, little bit more corrupted data, but we penalize it in the data that we observed. So now, why is this like gonna work? Let's try to think of, to build a little bit of, a, of uh, an intuition. So we have an exam of 10 questions and you are the professor and maybe you know the answers to like uh, five of these questions. So if you, if you tell the student that, look, I'm gonna grade you on this like uh, five questions. So the student is only gonna study for these five questions and then they're gonna perform well and they're gonna cheat. But what you do, is that you're gonna basically say uh, that, look, you're gonna be graded in this like uh, four questions maybe, but there's gonna be one more that is like a random question among these like 10 questions in the, in the exam. So basically the student, like there is a question that like they don't know if like the professor didn't know the answer um, or it was like uh, hidden to them. So what they're gonna do is in order to perform well in this exam, they're, they're gonna need to study for the whole exam. Um, so this kind of like the intuition, let's like, uh, try to see it with a visual so to see what we do. So maybe we have like an image of a cat that some pixels are missing and we know which pixels are missing. And what we can create is we can create this image of a cat that like has a little bit more pixels that are missing. And we ask the neural network to predict something, uh, but we penalize it on the observed pixels of this AXT. So now the model like for a corrupted, for any corrupted pixel, it doesn't know if it was corrupted like from nature, if the professor like didn't have the answer there or like we corrupted this intentionally and it's gonna be penalized there. So the only, the only way to perform well is to actually predict the clean image or at least the conditional expectation of the clean image given the observations, which is what we want in order to estimate the score. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, and we have some preliminary results with that. So we can like basically have like uh, a data set of like animal faces. And then like what we do is like, we just like randomly mask like 80% of the pixels so this is the data that we train on the left and on the right, uh, you have the model outputs. And you can do this like with a human face as well. So like this is your data on the left and on the right there are predictions of the model. And as you can see in all the predictions of the model, there are like uh, no like missing pixels uh, because the model was forced to learn the true thing uh, by doing this like extra corruption trick. And this like uh, continues to be working even if you increase the corruption. Uh, and at some point it's gonna fail just because like your optimization procedure is not gonna have like, you're not gonna have like infinite like samples or infinite training time. So if you like observe less and less and less at some point it's gonna fail, but it turns out it's like works pretty well even with like 80% of corruption or even higher. So that's like ends. Uh, so this is like the end of the technical part of the talk. And before taking the questions, um, the organizer asked me um, to um, tell you uh, an advice that I would give uh, to myself when I was like a first year PhD student, if I could go back in time and I could tell myself, okay, like what you should like pay attention to, what's like a good advice, what I would say. And I don't have one advice, but I have three advices and I'm really terrible at giving advices. Um, so like this is a disclaimer, but like, here's what I would say. So the first thing I would say is don't listen to advice. Um, really like things that work for others might not work for you and the opposite. Uh, diffusion models are actually a very good example of this because uh, for as far as I know, uh, people at Stanford were trying to develop them like many, many years and they kept failing. And they were like, the other people were like, okay, you should do guns, you should do flow models, you should do something else. And then all it took was the patience of a PhD student that was like stubborn enough to ignore all the advice and to actually make, make them work a little bit. And then this inspired other people to work. So that's the first thing, don't listen to advice. So the, first, the second thing is listen to advice. Uh, because I think like when I started my PhD, I was like too committed to my own ideas. I wanted to do my own things. Um, and then what I realized by talking to people was that like my ideas didn't matter that much. You know, like other people have their own research agendas. They have their own like uh, things that they care about. So you should always like listen to like the world and see like what is out there um, and like be able to talk to people and like kind of adjust like your own like um, desires and ideas according to what people think that it's important. And the third thing is like 
try to do reasons that wouldn't be done without him. Uh, I feel actually this is like the most important point for me. Um, I think like when I was when I started my PhD, I felt that I could do uh, I could solve a problem better uh, than someone else or faster than someone else. So this kind of like incentivized me to work on problems that were not that important. You know, like you could get like some new submission maybe accepted. Uh, or you could accept like a, you could get a paper accepted to ICML or some other like top venue. But at the end of the day, like if like someone else would do the same thing like two months later, it's not that important. It's not that you're advancing science that much. So I think like picking like good problems and picking hard problems and don't like not being afraid to fail is actually something that I would go back and tell that to myself and I would try to pick like harder problems. Uh, and that's like what I'm doing right now. So, okay, so we have a bunch of related papers uh, from our lab and some of them we talked briefly about today. Um, I'm ready to take your questions. Thanks so much for having me again. Let's give a um, quick virtual round of applause for Giannis before we move to the questions. Um, and if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat and I'll read them out loud or you can feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask a question ask a question. I guess I'll ask a quick question. First, great talk. And I also like the life lessons. <laughs> um, uh, so for the soft diffusion work where you're corrupting in a different way, I was unclear, did you get an advantage by corrupting in that way for the inverse problem that is related? And did you try different types of corruptions with the same inverse problem and see how it affected the results? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, this was the motivation. Uh, the quick answer is that we didn't ever get to do this uh, because it turned out that training like diffusion models for these other, other corruptions was hard enough and like it had a lot of like knobs uh, that we, we we did in that paper. Um, so the whole paper like would be too much uh, basically um, to write a paper that like first introduces the general diffusion models and then like tries to evaluate how they do diffusion models. So this is something that we're currently working on trying to show that like, you know, actually training for like deblaring is actually going to give you a generative model that's going to perform better on related inverse problems. That, but we don't have it right now. It's It's a very good question. We don't have it right now. Oh, yeah, well, I look forward to seeing those results. Thanks. Um, looks like there's a question in the chat. So someone asks, how can you employ the soft diffusion in a linear corruption system, which change the data dimensionality, namely A is rectangular? Yep. Uh, let me think. Yeah, th things things would still work. Um, like uh, the the soft diffusion law. I mean, okay. So okay. So let's let's try to clarify this a little bit. So the soft diffusion uh, the soft diffusion framework works uh, when you basically have uh, uh, you have a corruption system that like kind of corrupts like uh, your image in a smooth way in the sense that like it's like at, at the very limit when t goes to zero, uh, you actually don't have any corruption at all. Uh, and when like T goes very large, you have some very large corruption that maybe comes from your linear transformation and maybe on top of that, you have some noise. So now the thing is that like as long as, um, like as long as uh, at the end of the day, uh, your model gets to observe like uh, clean images. Uh, so like uh, the linear corruption system you're talking about, um, at some point it's like, uh, it doesn't drop dimensionality. Uh, and then you have like different scales that it drops dimensionality. Uh, I don't see like why this wouldn't work. For example, like the in painting case, uh, it is a case where like you drop dimensionality. We just like, what we do is like, we just uh, uh, give the input to the model as like an image that like some pixels are missing, we make them black. But instead of like giving like uh, black pixels to the model, you could just like give like what you observe and the locations of the pixels that uh, are missing. So this system would still work. Um, implementation wise, if you're actually trying to like make it work, it would be kind of like challenging because like you cannot do batch operations. So having the same size uh, is actually very useful in all, uh, in all the implementations because you can like load like things um, in batches and you can do the processing in batches. If like your linear system has like some property that like, you know, some like different samples in your batch have different sizes, you cannot like stack them efficiently in memory. 
Uh, but you know, there are ways to get around this. Like the simplest, the simplest way to get around it is to just like uh, use the pseudo inverse reconstruction, which is just like a very simple, like naive reconstruction uh, for that like brings back the dimensionality uh, of your data, and you can like train in this like pseudo inverse space, and that would be like something that you could do. Uh, Aviad, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, really good talk. I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was a great introduction to the topic. Um, I I like the neat idea that you had in the last part, where you kind of add you only have access to noisy data, and you add some extra noise there. And going back to your analogy to the student, does it really? So, is there a dependency on? Um, the number of pixels observed and how much noise you need to add. So, so you can think of if the extra question that the student will get has, you know, doesn't have a large grade or something, then the student will just ignore studying for the exam or something like that. Um, and so I'm just wondering, yeah, can you calibrate how much noisy pixels you need to add there? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, so, okay, so the answer is. So first of all, the way I present this, I only I only present this for like in random in painting. Uh, that was on purpose to make it like uh, easy to understand. And the uh, and the answer is that like our theoretical result. So we have a theoretical result, uh, and what it briefly says is that like the output of this optimization procedure is gonna uh, give you a model that it, it estimates the conditional expectation of the clean image given this a hat of xt. And this works even if a hat just like uh, is very very close to a. So this extra corruption that you are adding is like um, just like a little bit. And you can tune this. You can make it as little as, as you want. So for example, what we can do is that we get this image a a of x t. And what you do is that like uh, you flip a coin that is like biased. And for each pixel, uh, if it is observed, uh, you make it like non-observed with a probability delta. And that probability delta can go to zero, but it needs to be like, it, it, the limit can go to zero, but it needs to be positive. And like, I guess your question is like in practice, like does it work like if delta is arbitrarily small? And like uh, the answer is that like, we haven't really, really tuned this and see like how this like how this scales, but like what we are using in all of these experiments that we are making the probability to corrupt something that was like, uh, not originally corrupt, it would be 10%. So 10% of the time we got out some that we observed and this seems to be working very well. We don't see any like missing pixels in the generated images. Um, and um, and yes, like, you could even try to make delta even, even uh, smaller and theoretically there wouldn't be any problems uh, as long as your delta is positive and arbitrarily small, uh, but we haven't tried this. We suspect that it would break at some point uh, because like, you know, it would be, uh, just like minimal in the optimization, like the penalty that your model would get would be minimal, so it would be very like hard to figure it out. So now, this idea we have for random in painting that you like just corrupt a little bit more pixels generalizes naturally to like uh, more uh, like a broader family of like uh, these problems that you observe a of x t and a. So for example, what you could think is that like, you could think that your uh, nature, what it gives you, it gives you like A of XT and A is a Gaussian matrix. So it gives you like uh, Gaussian like projections uh, of, your, uh, of your like input. And maybe what you get to observe is you only get to observe like, so this matrix A, it might have like M rows. So you get to observe like just M measurements uh, from a signal that lives in like higher dimension, maybe N. Um, and you could still do this, but then like this, this trick that we're gonna do, they're gonna do is gonna be a little bit more discrete in the sense of like, instead of like just fitting to the model M rows, we're gonna fit to the model M minus one rows. And this like discrete procedure, it cannot go to zero, right? It's like, it's discrete. So we, we are uh, like adding an extra corruption that's like not neg negligible. Um, but yeah, you can kind of like uh, generalize this idea to, uh, more a broader family of problems. And for the most part, uh, you could just like uh, this extra corruption that you are adding, you can make it as negligible as you want. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And uh, I dropped off there for a little bit, but I caught that my internet is uh, flaky, but I caught the end of the, the answer. Um, and that's